ESPN, the world's leader in motorsports television, presents Speed World. Stardust International Raceway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Air is setting for the final act of the Canadian American Challenge Cup Series, which in nine weeks has spanned the country and raced twice in Canada. Today is a three-mile ribbon of asphalt, weaving through the giant sandbox like a lost lizard. It's a rough course, and because of its tabletop flatness, it's tough to remember. I'm Dave Despain. On this edition of the Glory Days, we go back to the year 1966 and something new and exciting. The Can-Am Series, a revolutionary North American road racing campaign and the richest road racing series ever held, is about to conclude outside Las Vegas. Fast cars, famous drivers, and an international flavor would help make Can-Am the Sports Car Club of America's all-time greatest hit. Here to cover the 66 series finale, Les Kiter, former U.S. road race champion Bob Holbert, and Chris Economaki. The drivers took a few more rounds than usual to acclimate themselves to the single-level raceway and the demands of high-speed cornering without reference points. From the driver's viewpoint, thundering down a 170-mile-an-hour straightaway, the corners are a bit difficult to unravel. So for many, it was a matter of committing the 10-turn, three-mile course to memory. You have to memorize it more, and you have to picture a curve in your mind rather than looking at it. So you have to remember where you are and then sort of plot your course by memory rather than uh, sight. So I uh, kind of like the course. Uh, it really doesn't have any blind corners. However, it is a little bit difficult in places to find the apex of the corner and knowing uh, exactly where to shut off. I think it, the effects could be a little bit uh, more well marked, perhaps, but uh, uh, apart from that, I think it's a very nice circuit. Qualifying was slow at first, but as the drivers became accustomed to the track, they set new records faster than a croupier gathers in the dice. Leading the onslaught, Jim Hall's 450 horsepower wing chaparral. Hall started with the second event in the series. Since then, he's proved his innovations are no mere eye-catchers. Both Hall and Hill are in contention for the title and sit 1-2 on the grid today. The Kiwis from Down Under are right behind. New Zealanders Bruce McLaren and Chris Amon and McLaren's tidy red Chevy-powered inventions have been consistent contenders throughout the series. Brilliant young Chris Amon qualified just behind the Chaparrales and two spots ahead of McLaren. Lanky Lola, campaigned throughout the series by John Surtees, is the third major chassis style represented. Surtees has put his Chevy-powered beast fourth on the grid. Only five-tenths of a second separates Surtees and the next four qualifiers. Scotland's Jackie Stewart, McLaren, former U.S. road racing champ George Fulmer, and USAC great Parnelli Jones. Four men are the high rollers for this race. Phil Hill, Bruce McLaren, Mark Donahue, and John Surtees are the top four in point standings for the Can-Am Cup with nearly $25,000 at stake for the series winner. Unflappable John Surtees leads going in with 18 points. He started with a stirring victory in the opener at San Jovi then went pointless till his triumph two weeks ago at the Times Grand Prix. Phil Hill with 18 points has only one overall victory, a thrilling two-heat performance at the Monterey Grand Prix when he and Jim Hall finished their chaparrales 1-2. Young Mark Donahue vaulted into international prominence when he captured first overall at most ports, which helped pile up to 17 points. Bruce McLaren has 14 points. No overall victories, but a consistent high-place finisher. 
So based on the point standings, these four men are the odds-on favorites to win the series. But Gurney, Hall, and Amon do have a mathematical chance. And in the case of the two-car Chaparral and McLaren entries, team strategy might be a factor. Jim, you and Phil, as a team here, have a possibility of finishing 1-2 in this series. Uh, do you, uh, I imagine this uh, has something to do with the strategy, how you're going to run this race. Well, Bob, as you know, you can't really start any strategy until after you see what develops in the race. But uh, if we had our choice, certainly uh, we'd try to make it work out that way. Principally, Bruce and I have to finish first and second. Uh, and we're going to try and do it accordingly. Uh, we don't have any definite strategy, but we're going to see how the race progresses. Jackie, here we are at the climatic event of the Can-Am Series. Uh, what is your strategy on running this race today? Well, I obviously to try and win it, but uh, I don't think at this point we have any strategy. Uh, I personally, I think we'll be taking things a little bit easy because it's an extremely hard circuit on brakes. And I feel that uh, quite a few of the cars are going to drop out by this. I'm just going to run it as I see it. Uh, we're going to have to come from behind if we're going to do anything. So I'll push as hard as I can and we'll see what happens. And hope your car's in good shape and they'll stand the gas. Is that it? Right. It looks a little bit dodgy on uh, brakes. I notice everybody's a little bit shy of brakes, and uh, I feel like uh, I wouldn't mind if we had a little more horsepower, but uh, I think we've got it working fairly well now. Well, Bob, uh, the way I feel about it, I just drive as hard as I can all the way, and uh, to at least if, uh, unless I get out, I'm fortunate enough to get up in front where uh, I could have somewhat of a lead, uh, I might back off there, but other than that, I drive hard all the way. Jim Hall broke all records in his Chaparral 2E with a 114-mile-per-hour lap. Teammate Phil Hill, second in the Can-Am standings, is behind Hall, a second slower. Then New Zealander Chris Amon to complete the front row. Canadian-American Challenge Cup leader John Surtees starts the second row with Jackie Stewart next. Fourth in the series standing, Bruce McLaren opens the third row, followed by George Palmer and Parnelli Jones. Young Mark Donahue, third in the standings, is 14th on the grid. The Stardust Grand Prix will really be a Las Vegas extravaganza. Eastern boys on the Stardust grid. And there's the checker. Surtees, McLaren, and Stewart take advantage of the long straight and make a bold play for the lead. They're four abreast heading for turn one. And it's Surtees squeezing by Hall at the corner to grab the lead from a third row starting position. Hall is second coming out of that first turn jam up. Twisting through the S's now, England's John Surtees is the point man, following the magnificent maneuver at the start. Jim Hall in pursuit with the rest of the pack, dropping in a single file through these tricky turns. Having had it again at Stardust. 
Turkey shows the way into the S's. Trouble for Hall. His flipper is gone for certain. Hydraulically operated flipper stabilizes the chaparral at high speeds. And deflected helps brake going into corners. Hall has said the flipper is integral to the car's design. He may be in serious trouble if it's broken. Third placer Jackie Stewart might well make his move very soon on Jim Hall. Surtees has stretched a bit on Hall, and here comes Stewart. Down the long back straight, Jackie Stewart passes the faltering Hall and takes second. The Johnny Scott Jackie Stewart sails off after Surtees. And Jim Hall lifts into the pit, an ailing flipper making the car unmanageable. And from the looks of Hap Sharp, that's the end of it for Hall. Hall's retirement is a setback to Chaparral Fortune. The crew readies the bad news for Phil Hill, and Chris Economaki talks with Jim Hall. I had some uh, trouble with the uh, spoiler, Chris. I had a structural failure on it, and uh, so I quit. Phil's car seems to be uh, sort of the worst for wear to the average looker. Is he going to make it? I don't think the car's hurt any. Uh, it's, it's probably down on performance a little bit because uh, he's got some extra drag. But uh, I don't think the car's hurt any. He'd probably be all right if he can uh, just keep in there. The chaparral out of his mirror for the moment. Surtees devotes himself to the perplexities of the course as he leads Stewart and Jones to the sickening switchbacks of the S's. driving well within himself now. Jackie Stewart next. A few steps back of the front three come Bruce McLaren and Dan Gurney, who's been moving up. battle for seventh. It's the most exciting action in the race. Right behind them, Aston Gregory barely leads dashing Peter Repson in another two-man battle royal. Third place McLaren has told his deficit to Surtees and slim margin over Gurney. It's Jackie Stewart who's McLaren's next target. But Stewart's off the track. We Scott plows up the moonscape, sending clouds of desert into the air and giving a photographer and course worker some anxious moments. Three fires quickly quenched. Then Stewart disappears in the science fiction movie myth. but he'll be lucky if that excursion didn't cause some damage. Cornelli Jones assumes second after Stewart's blast through the sand pile. McLaren's right on top of Jones. Chris Amon brings the other Team McLaren car into the pits. A pit stop during these short races can only mean trouble, and it looks bad. demise. Chris Economaki in the pits to learn what happened from Eamon. I had the same trouble in practice yesterday. It's not actually a gearbox itself. It's a limited slip diff. And uh, we broke one yesterday. And put it, it was an old one. We put a new one in. And that's gone too. Why? I really don't know. 
McClure, in the meantime, is pressing on. He's passed Parnelli Jones and taken second. Jackie Stewart has been out of contention since his earlier trip to the Rocky Verge. This time, it looks like the likable Scott's out for good. Stewart's problem is diagnosed as a ruptured gas line, and he retires the Lola permanently, abandoning it to the desert waste. John Surtees, with things very much his own way, is solidly in command and setting his own pace. McLaren is now second. Followed by Gurney, Jones, and Phil Hill. the decisive final round of the inaugural Can-Am series back in 1966. Off-course adventures for the Wee Scott, Jackie Stewart, and misfortune for Jim Hall mark the early portion of this 66 series finale. As we rejoin the Stardust Grand Prix, John Surtees remains way out front, and Hall's second car in the hands of point leader Phil Hill is locked in a spirited battle for third, fourth, and fifth. tries to pass Parnelli heading toward turn two. But Jones resists the crippled Chaparral and holds on to fourth. Fulmer and Donahue are still at it. Fulmer in the number 16 Lola, best Donahue, and grabbed six. 20 laps after having been passed by Donahue. puts it in the paddock, a broken drive shaft responsible. Jones and Hill continue their duel. And then Phil Hill's wing snaps in almost the same place as partner Jim Hall. Hill severely slowed, and Parnelli Jones now sits uncontested and solidly in third. brings the wounded Chaparral to the pit. This time, it's decided surgery is warranted, especially since Bill is so high in the series point standing. The damaged body work is cleaned up. At the same time, the faulty wing is removed and a brace inserted to buttress the upright support. Hill will be able to return to the fray. Chris Economaki talks with Ball's partner, Hap Sharp. A very tough break, Hap. I guess he's blown the series lead, hasn't he? I would say he definitely has, Chris. What was the problem there? It's identically the same problem that Jim Hall had. Uh, apparently it was a fatigue failure. Uh, Jim said at the time that he came in that the same thing would probably happen to Phil's car because they've, they've both got about the same time on them. Barnelli Jones joins the ranks of the sideline. Gearbox trouble plaguing him the last few laps. He'll be in and out, but finish the race. Palmer and Donahue dogfight continues, and with retirements up front, battling now for third behind Bruce McLaren. And down the pit straight, Donahue moves on Palmer as his boss, Roger Penske, signals, go get him. Donahue shoves his foot to the boards and nips by Palmer just at the end of the pit straight. Consistent Mark Donahue finds himself in third place as the race enters its final lap. Surtees, through all of this, has been quietly averaging more than 110 miles per hour. Claire is on the same lap in second. Palmer pits and retires after a furious race-long battle with Mark Donahue. And everyone else might as well be chasing the long afternoon shadows as Surtees is a runaway. Lucky Bruce McLaren is on the same lap but unable to close. Mark Donahue holds third with the prospect of enough points to finish second in the series. Bill Hill is still circulating. Jones, too, but with only fourth gear available. And there's the checker for John Surtees. 
Peter Rempson finished fourth after a steady ride, and Hill Chaparral finishes out of the points in seventh. Stardust Grand Prix and Can-Am title to John Surtees, who averaged almost 110 miles an hour for the race and led it from wire to wire. He wins some $40,000 for less than two hours at the wheel. Well, the race went very well. In fact, it developed a little better than I had hoped it would. Uh, early on, naturally, it was very close, but most of the time, uh, I was able to sort of keep the car well in hand and sort of basically drive as I wanted to, which was the main thing. John, many uh, competitors in today's race went out with mechanical troubles, suspension problems primarily, and transmission problems. You had none of those troubles, did you? Um, I don't think so. I had this vibration, but uh, the course is very hard on a car. You have to use the gearbox a lot because you've got a wide variation of corners. You've also got a very rough section uh, on the straight which tends to uh, give the car a fairly hard time. And so uh, this was to be expected, I think. We tried, in fact, to do as few laps as possible uh, so uh, that we didn't wear the car out too much. Mark Donahue, following his third place finish, barely edged Bruce McLaren for second in the series. What about the trials and tribulations of running in this tough series? What's the big problem? Oh, the biggest problem is making sure that you finish the car, but still at the same time uh, running it just about as hard as you possibly can to stay uh, in contention during the race. Congratulations, Bruce. Third place in the first Canadian American Challenge Cup Series and second overall in the Stardust Grand Prix. A fine performance for you and your car. Are you pleased? Well, finishing second at this stage is almost like not finishing at all, Chris. We're not too happy, but that was as good as we could do. The car ran, the car ran perfectly. I drove it as hard as it could, it could go, and we finished second. Yeah, that's it. What about the race itself? Did it develop the way you thought it would? Um, no, not really. I expected more di uh, more close racing for first place. Uh, 30s got into that lead very early and uh, took advantage, I think, of the little bit of bunching up that we had uh, in the first couple of laps. And he really made a beautiful break. He was he was going particularly was going very fast. Um, I expected a few more cars to finish, particularly the Chaparrales. That's unusual for them. And uh, as far as I was concerned, it's about the most hectic race uh, I've, uh, I've ever had. The Can-Am series was judged an immediate success. In its first year, more than 150,000 people saw the six events and more than $250,000 was awarded. Nor was there a more fitting setting for the finale than the Stardust Grand Prix. Well, 13's timely win at inaugural Can-Am Championship got that series off to a spectacular start, and it remained America's premier road racing show for 15 years. Bruce McLaren's Las Vegas disappointment didn't last long. He came back to win the championship himself in 67 and 69. The cars that bear his name claimed five straight titles. Bruce died testing a new Can-Am car in 1970. I'm Dave Despain. Join us again next week for another edition of The Glory Days.